Greetings to all of you. These days of the feast that we are keeping, these days of the feast that we can so greatly appreciate and, and enjoy, they do picture a wonderful time of refreshing that is coming for all mankind. It cannot be stopped. It is the plan and purpose of the living Jesus Christ to return to this earth in great power and glory and majesty, coming with all power to put down all rebellion, to stop all of the problems that are so incumbent upon this earth now, but coming to bring peace, great peace, happiness, joy, prosperity, abundance beyond compare. Yes, these days picture a wonderful time of refreshing that will certainly come. Turn to Acts chapter 3, and we will read starting in verse 19. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be, be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come. And notice, the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Yes, before we can have refreshing for this earth, before mankind can have refreshing, then the living Jesus Christ must return to start, to initiate, we would say inaugurate this time picture. Verse 20, And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution or the restoring of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all of his holy prophets since the world began. Yes, God has a plan and a timetable. And these days picture that things will flow in a specific manner. God will always accomplish things and do things as he has prophesied, as he has proclaimed through his word. He will do them on time. And these days again, picture that wonderful time when the earth will begin to have the peace that it has needed, that it has desired, and yet, apart from God's way, the world in general has never been able to have the peace, joy, happiness, and abundance that they do desire. But they are going to have it. And as we rejoice in these days of the feast, keep in mind that we are called. We are called to have a specific part in this coming kingdom of God. It is a priceless opportunity, a priceless opportunity and responsibility that is awaiting us in these times of refreshing. Turn to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 32, and we can read here, Again, in respect to the times of refreshing and what will be the, the initial emphasis as such, that is, who will bring about these days, these times of refreshing. And we read in Isaiah chapter 32 and verse 1, Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. So Jesus Christ is going to be ruling and reigning in righteousness. And of course, the missing ingredient in this world today is the reality that righteousness isn't the order of the day. Righteousness, that is the keeping of the commandments, is basically ignored around the world and by all mankind. But we will be there with Jesus Christ. Princes will rule with Jesus Christ. And a man in verse 2, or as it can be, that these, that is the king and the princes that will rule with him, will be a hiding place from the wind, 
a covert from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. Yes, a weary land will receive the help. They will receive the blessings. They will receive the encouragement that they need. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 tells us that we are called to be part of a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, that we are called out of darkness into a marvelous light for one reason and one purpose, and that is to show forth the praises of him that is, of God the Father and Jesus Christ, who have called us out of this darkness into a marvelous light. And we are to be engaged in the preaching, the proclaiming, the publishing of this good news that is there. It is a certainty for the future. It will surely come. In verse 21 of Second Peter chapter 2, it is mentioned there, that Jesus Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. The steps of Jesus Christ lead to these days. The steps of Jesus Christ lead to the millennial rule. They lead to these days that we picture now in respect to the days of the Feast of Tabernacles. And if we are to follow in the footsteps of the living Jesus Christ, then we will need to be following his lead as he guides and directs us toward the ultimate fulfillment of these days. We have a calling, an opportunity, and a great responsibility. In other words, we are called... When these days are fulfilled in their completeness, we are called not just to a front row seat, but to a front row opportunity and responsibility. How blessed we are. What a wonderful, awesome future is there, guaranteed by the living God and Jesus the Christ. When Jesus Christ walked this earth, he performed any number of miracles, and the miracles that he performed had great meaning for these days. That is, had great meaning for the future when the Feast of Tabernacles would become a reality in the kingdom and family of God after Christ returns. Jesus Christ accomplished things that were truly awesome inspiring, and of course they reflected the reality of these days when they are fulfilled. They also reflected an awesome promise for all mankind, and these days again do reflect days and times of awesome promise for all mankind. One of the things that Jesus Christ mentioned One of the things that his miracles did indicate was that of abundant life. I have a few points that I will be covering during the time of the sermon, and these points will tie in with and be reflective of the miracles that Jesus Christ performed that pointed to a time when there would be abundance, happiness, joy, peace of mind. The first point is abundant life. The living Jesus Christ in John chapter 10 and in verse 10, latter part of the verse, he makes the plain statement that he came and he is coming not only that we might have life, but life more abundantly. So the first point is is abundant life. These days picture a reality of abundant life for all mankind. Turn to Amos, Amos chapter 9, and we will read about the abundant life that will be made available to all mankind eventually. 
in Amos chapter 9 and reading, starting with verse 13, it says, Behold, the days come, says the Lord. And if the Lord God, if Jesus Christ does say these things, then they will surely come to pass. That the plowman shall overtake the reaper. Indicative of an awesome abundance. No longer mankind having to earn their bread as such through the sweat of their brow. No longer the land being cursed because of the disobedience of mankind going back to the time of the Garden of Eden. But the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes him that sows seeds and the mountains shall drop sweet wine. And all the hills shall melt. In the New International Version, it says, New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from the hills. Yes, there will be an abundance, an absolute abundance. Turn to John chapter 2. In respect to the hills and the mountains dropping or flowing with new wine, Symbolic again of the good life. In the, in the Gospel of John, chapter 2, this is the, the situation or the occurrence where Christ did turn the water into wine. Reading in chapter 2, verse 1, In the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. It was a joyous occasion. And in that respect, we can look to all of the millennial rule of Jesus Christ as being a joyous occasion as contrasting the way that things are now. Verse 3, And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. You know the story in the overview. And in verse 7, Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they fill them up to the brim. And he said unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they, so they took it to the governor of the feast. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it came, or how it was produced or brought about, but the servants which drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom and said unto him, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but you have kept the good wine until now. Perhaps this is a strong indicator here that all of the wine. As such, in the millennium will be good wine. Not that individuals won't be making their own wine and perhaps not all have the same uh, quality or from the same variety of grapes. But the indicator here in respect to the living Jesus Christ, when he creates something, when he does something, it is the best. It is something that is to be enjoyed to the fullest And these times of refreshing are going to start with and only start with the return of Jesus the Christ. So he turned water into wine. And verse 11 says, this beginning of miracles. Jesus Christ turned water into wine. Now, we do not have the ability at the moment or at this time to do these things. Perhaps in the millennium as necessary, we as part of the first fruits that will be born into the kingdom and family of God at Christ's return, perhaps we will do some of these things as necessary, both to supply a need and also as an example of the awesome power and majesty and also service as such of those in the kingdom and family of God. Yes, Christ turning the water into wine reflected the abundant life, and it was good wine. It was the best. In John chapter 6, thinking again 
of his miracles and of the abundant life that they picture, that they did picture. They were of value then, but they certainly picture the way things will be in the coming kingdom and family of God. John chapter 6 and in verse in verse 5. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he said unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now he knew what he would do, as it mentions here, but he wanted to test their understanding. He wanted to test what their ideas and thoughts might have been after having been with him, traveling with him, and seeing all the things that he did. Verse 6 says, And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. And Jesus Christ does know what he is going to do during the millennial reign. He knows what he is going to do. He knows what he will have us doing in the overview working with and under him and bringing about the abundant life for all mankind. In verse 9, there was a lad here which had five barley loaves and two small fish. But the question that was posed, what are they among so many? And Jesus said, make the men sit down. See, he didn't even enter into the discussion as it were. Well, let me explain what's going to happen. He simply just said, have the men sit down in an orderly manner. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. And if we would give each of these a wife and two children, we were talking or we would be talking in respect to around at least 20,000 people. Verse 11, and Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks. Notice, when he had given thanks. Jesus Christ, when he walked the earth in the flesh, he was a perfect example of what we would term today to be a Christian. He was the perfect example of all that he said and did and thought And here, the first thing that he did was to thank our Heavenly Father, to thank his Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Father. He gave thanks, and then he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fish as much as they would. When they were filled, notice, when they were filled, it wasn't a matter, will we run out? When they were filled, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Now, he told them ahead of time that there would be, there would be food left over. Therefore, they gathered them together, or as mentioned here, after they were filled. It wasn't that Christ had to look around, as it were, to see if everyone had had enough to eat. It was obvious by the way they were eating and enjoying it. And Christ knew that there was going to be an abundance left over. Therefore, they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Then these men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth that prophet that should come into the world. And yes, it is a truth that that prophet is going to return. He is going to return and he is going to bring about these times of refreshing that in type we are enjoying now. This was a tremendous miracle. But in thinking of it in the complete context Perhaps the greater miracle wasn't just that he was able to create enough food to feed up to 20,000 people perhaps or more, but that when everyone was finished, when everyone was completely filled, when everyone had, had enjoyed the abundant life, there was far more left over than they started with. Only God the Father and Jesus Christ 
can take something and the more they give away, the more it grows. This, again, is an awesome reality that we can look forward to in the kingdom and family of God. Now, as human beings, if we, if I or you, if we had only two of something, perhaps uh, two uh, apples or maybe it would be uh, two automobiles, as the case might be, if we gave away one, we would only have one left. In other words, if we humanly would give away, it diminishes. But in God's way, in the way of the abundant life that is surely coming, the more that is given, the more is left over. What a wonderful way What a wonderful time that we can contemplate. And brethren, right now, the world is waiting. The whole world is waiting. The whole world is desiring. And the whole world is needing this time of refreshing. I remember as a young man in the military and I was stationed in North Africa. A friend of mine we were traveling one day. We decided to drive out into the countryside and we took along some food to have a picnic lunch, as it were. And we stopped in an area and we noticed uh, not too far away there was a shepherd boy, a young shepherd boy that was watching over some sheep. We enjoyed our picnic lunch and we noticed that The little boy was watching, and so we called or we motioned for him to come over where we were, and we gave him the remainder of the food that we had and perhaps some other things like candy bars, and the little boy was overjoyed. This, again, was a scene in a place in North Africa during the 1950s. And we noticed after we left there was over much farther away in the distance, there was an adult. And as soon as we had gone, as soon as we had driven away and glancing in the mirrors, we saw this adult come running over and took away all that we had given to the little boy. Well, The world, the world is waiting, desiring and needing what these days do picture. In Isaiah chapter 55, considering again the point for the moment that of abundant life, chapter 55 of Isaiah, now at the time that we were there, Very few people could afford just in physical things as we might uh, refer to the abundance that is so much a part of some nations on the face of the earth. But the bulk of the nations have never had in physical things, just the basic necessities, food, shelter, clothing, have never had the abundant life. The abundant life that we in the United States or in some other countries do enjoy today in physical things. But in Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 1, it says, Ho, everyone that thirsts, come you to the waters, and he that has no money, come you, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Without money, without price. All can afford this price. That is a price. If it is free, freely we have received. And we are called to freely give. And especially to be able to freely give under the living Jesus Christ when we are born into the kingdom and family of God. To be a help in a far greater way than we can even begin to imagine or to anticipate today. Without money, without price. For everyone, notice it says everyone that does thirst. Not just a few, but everyone. 
A few years ago at a feast site in Southern California, we uh, had gone as a group, a number of us had gone as a group to a wild animal park there. And there's a family that my wife and I are very close to and Basically, we consider their children, our grandchildren as such, and their children's names, the oldest is is Anthony, and then the youngest one is Joseph. Well, at that time, Anthony was four years old, and Joseph was just a baby, three or four months old. And so as we were going in the gate there at the park, and an attendant was counting us, making sure that there weren't going to be more than had already been paid for. And so he was counting the number, and he was counting the adults, and someone else was helping him. And so he he pointed to Anthony, who was four years old, and he said, and the little boy there said, count him. And then he went on counting. But Anthony's little brother, baby brother at that time, Joseph, was in a baby carriage, and he was only three or four months old, and the person that was doing the counting just skipped right over him and went on counting. And so Anthony interrupted him, and he said, he's a boy too. <laughs> yes, he, <laughs> he is a boy too. He may be young, uh, he may be very small, but he counts. He does count. Don't overlook him. He is a boy, too. Then last year at the feast, we happened to be at a feast site last year where this same family was there. And Joseph now is four years old, and he was really enjoying the feast. And every day he was enjoying the feast. He would come around and talk to you and very friendly, very effervescent in his overall approach. And... On the morning when we were going to have family day, he got up that morning, his mother said, and he told his mother, he said, this is going to be the funnest day yet. The (laughs) The funnest day yet. Yes, the day that is the most fun. All days were fun, but he said, this is going to be the funnest day yet. None will be left out. There is coming the best day yet. There is coming the most fun day yet for all mankind, and none will be left out. What an awesome future. What an inspiring and encouraging future these days do picture. Number two, and another point here reflected by the miracles of the living Jesus Christ, the world can look forward to abundant peace and safety. Not just peace and safety in small measure, but abundant peace and safety. In Exodus 14 and verse 13, the admonition was given by God through Moses to the Israelites there as they were hemmed in between the sea and Pharaoh's army, they were told to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Now, perhaps in some small ways they did this, but in the overview, ancient Israel never did really trust God. They never really did stand still and put their hope and trust and faith in God, obey Him, so that God would have worked things out for them in a wonderful and marvelous way from the very beginning. In Leviticus chapter 26, and reading in verse 2, it says, You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, notice here, this was before Israel, ancient Israel, entered the land And God promised them that if they would obey, they would have had everything that is promised for the world, physically for the world in the millennium, if they would have obeyed God. 
He said, if you will walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, then I will give you rain in due season. And the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Again, Adam and Eve, or our human parents as such, from day one, all of mankind could have had the good life. God created Adam and Eve and placed them in a garden. He didn't place them in some barren place. They could have had the good life, but they rejected God's way. And so here, the Israelites, ancient Israel, they could have had the good life, but sadly, as we know and understand, they rejected God's way. Verse 5, and your threshing shall reach unto the vintage. Some of the very same terminology that we read regarding the millennium, where that the plowman will overtake the reaper. And the vintage shall reach unto the sowing time, and you shall eat your bread to the full, and dwell in your land safely. And I will give peace in the land, notice, and you shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. What a wonderful promise to our forefathers of ancient Israel. But sadly, they did not appreciate it and they did not obey God. And I will rid evil beasts out of the land. Neither shall the sword go through your land. No war. God would have been fighting their battles if only they had looked to him and trusted in him. They didn't. Modern-day Israel certainly is not looking to God or trusting in God, and the world is not, but they will. These days, once again, picture a wonderful, marvelous reality whereby all of the world will eventually enjoy abundant peace and safety. In Isaiah chapter 65, and we read in verse 25, "...the wolf and the lamb shall feed together." And the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. Nowhere in the kingdom of God will there be harm or will there be any destruction once the world starts to obey God and starts to follow the lead of the living Jesus Christ. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain says the Lord. Wonderful promise for the future. When my grandson was young, he was perhaps two and a half or three years old at this time, and and in respect to peace and safety, there was a dog that uh, the neighbors next door had, and The dog may have been uh, prone to bite someone if he could have gotten through the fence, but there was a good fence there, and he really couldn't get from from the one yard over into the yard where uh, my uh, family there live. And anyway, I was telling my grandson because he had a big old dog named J.D. And J.D., big old dog, I don't think he had a mean bone in his body. I don't know how much protection he really might have been uh, if the other dog had gotten over in the yard, but he certainly was big enough to take care of this other animal. But my grandson told me, he said, now if that bad dog, and he called it the bad dog versus J.D., who was the good dog. So he said, if that bad dog gets over in our yard, He said, J.D. will grab him, throw him flat of his back, will jump right on him, and will beat him black and blue and white. (laughs) Now, I, I have always heard in respect if someone was beaten up, perhaps they would be beaten black and blue. I had never heard the word white, but perhaps this meant that that was putting righteousness in the equation so that that J.D. would make a righteous dog out of the bad dog. But, again, my grandson, he was was convinced that certainly that he would be protected. Now, all of us, I'm sure, to some degree or another, that we have fears and phobias. 
And I myself have several things I know we need not be afraid of in the overview with God's help and protection of anything, but certain things will startle me or I will be frightened by. And one of the things, and perhaps the main thing as far as something in nature that I would be frightened by, it would be snakes. I had someone ask me one time specifically, well, are you afraid of all snakes? And I said, no, not really. I'm not really scared of all snakes, just two kinds. And those are live ones and dead ones. And apart from, <laughs> apart from live snakes and dead snakes, I am not frightened of them. But I do have this fear and this phobia that I'm sure God in his mercy in the overview when there will be no harm, no destruction in all of his kingdom and certainly when we're born into the kingdom and family of God that whatever our human physical fears or concerns or phobias may be that we will get over these. And I do look forward to that day and time. One evening along this same line regarding peace and safety. And in the overview, we're talking about peace of mind. Physical safety, yes. Peace of mind, yes. Being safe and secure, mentally, emotionally, physically, in every way. And one evening, going back a number of years ago, my wife and I had been somewhere and we returned home. And she went into the kitchen. I had gone back to another room, and I heard my wife scream. It was a blood-curdling scream. It made, uh, using the, the uh, analogy or cliche, it made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. I was sure that something was terribly wrong. So I go rushing into the kitchen. My wife is standing there trembling, and she said... It was a mouse. But she didn't just say that it was a mouse. She said it was a big, bad mouse. <laughs> and, I, and I guess in that circumstance or circumstances like that for her, it would be big and bad. Now, I saw the poor little mouse. It was much more frightened of my wife <laughs> than, than perhaps she was of it. But that fear is there. Well, again, mentally, emotionally, physically, fear will be removed. And in the overview, even spiritually, that fear will be removed when people come to understand God's awesome and marvelous plan of salvation that isn't the way that things are pictured by the world in respect to traditions of men, in respect to... Uh, ideas of an ever-burning hell or things like that. When the world is taught the truth, then there is going to be peace of mind, joy, peace of mind, peacefulness physically, mentally, emotionally, in every way. In Micah chapter 4, continuing with this thought, in Micah 4 and verse 1, In the last days it shall come to pass... Again, an emphatic statement, not that maybe this will happen or perhaps or hopefully, but it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains and it shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow into it. Yes, all of the kingdoms of this world, whether they be great or small, all will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. Verse 2. And the nations shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, and to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, and law for the law, that is, love toward God and love toward neighbor, the foundation of how that God's government will always be administered. For the law shall go forth of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. 
but they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree. Not just a matter of in some passive way that they will learn war no more, but it will be a way of peace, of joy, of happiness and abundance, of people being able to do things, travel here, go there, visit here, and yet it will be peaceful and enjoyable everywhere they go. And certainly, home will always be a very peaceful place. And so we read, But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree. And in the overview here, again, a picture, an indicator. We're not going to have people in the way of mankind, in the way of following the lead, we might say, of Satan, the devil, and his way, we're not going to have people that will be trying to take someone else's land. That is, after a certain time period going into the millennium, finally all nations will finally learn and know who the living Jesus Christ really is. And so there is going to be peace and happiness and joy and abundance. And if anyone has the idea that they might desire to take from someone else and or to steal or to harm someone else that will be taken care of by the proper authorities which will be god the father and jesus christ or jesus christ reigning right here on this earth under the overall guidance and direction as always of god the father and jesus christ and we will be part of that chosen generation and royal priesthood that will be there to show the way. And so it says that they will sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. Now, if anyone on this earth today, or if one man had the approbation and approval of all men now, and would say, I'm going to take care of you totally and completely, you won't need to worry you can lie down and none make you afraid, it still wouldn't happen. This isn't the way of this world, this present evil world. But it is going to happen. Why? Last part of verse 4, For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it, and it is impossible for God to lie, and so it will occur. Yes, there will be peace and joy and abundance. Mark chapter 4 Another one of the miracles of Christ that is recorded here that is indicative of the wonderful reality of these days. In Mark chapter 4 and in verse 37, and there arose a great storm of wind. Notice it was a great storm of wind. And the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. It was filling up with water. It would have capsized. And in the physical sense of the word, uh, maybe they would have drowned. But he, that is Christ, in verse 38, was in the stern or the back part of the ship. He was asleep on a pillow. And there is a lesson for us here. Remember that God's spirit is not a spirit of fear but a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. And Jesus Christ had perfect peace because he was using God's spirit perfectly and he had that perfect peace of mind. And so at the end of a day when he was physically tired, he could lie down and did lie down and he had gone to sleep. And they awakened him and said unto him, Master, care you not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind. And he said unto the sea, Peace, be still. He didn't have to go into some long monologue, as it were. He didn't have to say a lot. He simply said, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. See, it went from being a great storm to a great calm at the words of Jesus Christ. I know we do worry about the weather today, and many times I have been frightened. 
by storms. But again, those fears and phobias will be taken away in this kingdom and family of, of God. And as the physical human beings that will remain, the remnant that will be there at the beginning of the millennium, and as they grow in understanding and grace and knowledge, more and more people will be able to lie down and none make them afraid. In Zechariah, for another scripture here in respect to abundant peace and safety, in Zechariah, Chapter 8, we read about Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem, the very name itself, is reflective of a city of peace. Salem or peace, a city of peace. Yet we know that Jerusalem, in the overview, has never really experienced lasting peace for any period of time at all, but it is going to. And so here we have a promise from the living God in Zechariah 8 and in verse 1. Again, the word of the Lord of hosts came to me saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I was jealous for her with great fury. Thus says the Lord, I am returned unto Zion, and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth. It isn't now. There are many people proclaiming that their way or their idea might be the way of truth, but it isn't a city of truth today, but it will be. And the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus says the Lord of hosts, there shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem, and every man with his staff in his hand for very age. Now, you cannot have boys and girls playing in the streets of Jerusalem today and older people without a fear of there being a terrorist attack. But the day will come that there will be perfect peace and safety within the streets of Jerusalem for both the young and the old, and it will truly be a city of peace. And it will be the city of the great king, Jesus the Christ, who will, be, who will be ruling and reigning from there. And we have, again, the marvelous opportunity to be there ruling with him. Point number three, as we think about, again, the wonderful future reality of these days, there will be abundant peace or there will be abundant health and energy. I had just covered abundant peace and safety. There will be abundant health and energy. In Isaiah chapter 35, and I'm sure that uh, health and energy perhaps will mean more to some of us who are a bit older than it does to those who are younger. But in Isaiah chapter 35 and verse 1, the wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. Again, it's going to be a time of the abundant life. It shall blossom abundantly, it says at the beginning of verse 2. Then in verse 3, strengthen you the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come. Yes, it is an emphatic, very positive and very real statement for the future. Your God will come with vengeance, even with a recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the, of the deaf, deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart or a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. Yes, abundant health and energy. We're all familiar, or at least I'm sure most of us, with some of the stories about people getting older and retiring and perhaps uh, some cliches that have been stated uh, regarding this. But I'm remembering the one uh, humorous statement said this gentleman 
had anciently waited or had, had waited anxiously, as it were, for the time to come when he could retire and have more leisure time and sit out on his porch of an evening in a rocking chair and enjoy the peace, quiet, solitude of the evening. And as the story went, he finally reached this stage, but then he said after he was able to retire and have his rocking chair, he no longer had the energy to to start the chair rocking. (laughs) Now, perhaps this is a bit of hyperbole in respect to an illustration, but also a a cliche that I have heard regarding older people, and it says that my get up and go has got up and left. And yes, as we do get older, that happens. And I remember a song from many, many years ago that mentioned that um, when this person was young, when I was young, I could jump a picket fence but now I'm lucky if I jump an inch. But there will be abundant, abundant peace. There will be abundant health and energy. Kids have energy now, but as we get older, that basic normal energy disappears. Well, all will have all of the health and energy that they will need to truly enjoy life in the coming kingdom and family of God. Another example, this one in Acts, in respect to what was done, a miracle that was done by and through the power of the living Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 3, we are familiar with the story in verse 1, when Peter and John had gone up to the temple at a given time, verse 2, and a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. And he was there to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked for something. This was his means of a livelihood. But then in verse 6, then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by his right hand and he lifted him up and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Can you think about the joy, the happiness that was there? He couldn't contain himself. And I would say if we had been there, perhaps we would have been jumping and leaping with joy right along with him. This is the way it will be in the kingdom and family of God. In Luke chapter 18, and I will just paraphrase in the overview here, Luke 18 and verses 35 through 43. And this was a case where that this person had cried out to Jesus Christ to get his attention. Others were trying to stop him from as they were looking at it, causing a commotion. But he had been blind, and he knew that Jesus was going by, and he wanted to receive his sight. So he kept on importuning the living Jesus Christ as he was walking there. And so Christ, as always, when something like this occurred, he had great compassion, and he gave him back his sight. And the person went forward then praising God, honoring God. Yes, there is coming a time when there will be jumping with joy, when there will be leaping with joy, when there will be praising of God because the lame will walk, the blind will see. It will be all-encompassing for all. I'm reminded of, of a little episode uh, not too many years ago I, I referred to it in this manner that I was watching a couple of what I was referring to in in an overview just calling them kids and uh, they were up on this mountain uh, one mountain peak and they were talking about wouldn't it be nice if we wanted to be on the other mountain piece if we didn't have to walk down there wouldn't it be nice that if we did we had plenty of energy if we could just sail as it were over from this mountain like, a, uh, like an eagle, over to the other. And they were talking about how wonderful it would be. And I was thinking, yes, how wonderful it would be. 
And incidentally, one of the kids was 65 years old. The other was 75 years old. And it, I guess it just shows that in our hearts and in our minds, uh, we are always, we can think in young terms even when we get older. But the time is coming when even physically, whether young or old, there will be all of the health and energy that is necessary for the abundant good life. In Isaiah chapter 40, and we read in verse 28, Have you not known, have you not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, faints not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. Notice it said that they, that as far as, as God is concerned and God's inherent power and might, that he never faints. He never gets weary. And in verse 9, or verse 29, it says, He gives power to the faint, and to them that has no might, he increases strength. He increases strength. But then in respect to human, human power and strength, It says, even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. Yes, the day is coming when we will have all the energy that we need physically, that is the human population of the millennium. And for those of us in the kingdom and family of God, born among the first fruits, the day will come that we will run and not grow weary. We will walk and never again be faint. Fourth point, abundant knowledge and understanding that is of truth, of God's truth, of the reality of God. The world today does not know God. The world is blinded by traditions of men and the understanding and or lack of understanding of men. But that will change. We're promised that in Isaiah chapter 25. And in verse 6, it says, And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wine on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wine on the lees, well refined, choice wine, choice meats. And he will destroy in that mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. Yes, we are called to be a part of the removing of that veil spread over all nations. We read about this in Isaiah chapter 30 and down in verse 19. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. You shall weep no more. He will be very gracious unto you at the voice of your cry, and he shall hear it. He will answer you, and though the Lord give you the bread of adversity... And the water of affliction, yet shall not your teachers be removed into a corner any more, but your eyes shall see your teachers, and your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way, walk you in it. Yes, we are called to be the teachers that are there under the living Jesus Christ. There will be no more false education, no more satanic propaganda that is passed along as truth, but there will be truth. The truth of our creator God, his son Jesus the Christ, the truth of the purpose for mankind being created and of our awesome opportunity and responsibility for those of us who have the opportunity to be among the first fruits. Yes, it is going to be a wonderful time. And in In Isaiah 11 and verse 9, last part of the verse, it says that the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. We are part of the team as such that will be accomplishing this under the living Jesus Christ. The earth will become full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in Hebrews 8 and verses 10 through 12, and I will just refer to this and paraphrase somewhat, that here in, in the millennium for those physically who are living and then specifically in the last great day, God's commandments are being, going to be written in our hearts 
in our minds, in their hearts, in their minds, not on tables of stone. And so God says at that time, because of this, all shall know me from the least to the greatest. All shall know me from the least to the greatest. What a wonderfully effective re-education program for all mankind. And once again, we are called not to a front row seat, but to a front row opportunity and responsibility. Final point, and we will address briefly our opportunity and our responsibility. Let's, let's phrase it this way, our abundant opportunity and responsibility. In 1 Peter 2.9, which I had referred to earlier, we are called, that is, we are called to be a part of a chosen generation and a royal priesthood. By analogy, the royal blood of the family of God will flow in our veins. And in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3, we are told that those that turn many to righteousness, those that turn many to commandment keeping as opposed to what is being done sadly today, where people are being turned away from the path to life, that is the way of love toward God and love toward neighbor. People are being turned away from commandment keeping, but we are told that we will be, those who turn many to righteousness will shine as the stars forever and ever. And we are called to be there both during the millennium and during the last great day when truly rivers of living waters will flow. In Ecclesiastes chapter 11, I want to reference a scripture here in respect to, again, our awesome and wonderful opportunity and responsibility. In Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse 1 says, Cast your bread upon the waters, for you shall find it after many days. Now, Jesus Christ, of course, is the living bread. He is the bread of life, and if we eat of him as it is stated, we, that is where eternal life is. Verse 2 says, Give a portion to seven and also to eight, for you know not what evil shall be upon the earth. Notice, we are to cast our bread upon many waters and receive the return after many days. In essence, we are to be a part of casting the good news about the true bread of life upon many waters. It says, Give a portion to seven, the Feast of Tabernacles, the seventh day of the 7,000-year period, the millennial rest, give a portion to seven. Unless we are there to serve and to help, we cannot give a portion to seven. And then also it says to eight. So it is all-inclusive, not only of the millennial reign, but the last great day when rivers of living waters will flow. And remember what happened on the eighth day as far as circumcision. Jesus Christ was circumcised on the eighth day. It is the eighth day, but in respect to a weekly cycle, it is also going back to the first day. It is a new beginning. And the eighth day will be a new beginning for billions and billions of mankind that have never had an opportunity to know the truth, but they will. The absolute certainty of God's promises assures that they will have an opportunity. And so we are called to be there to be able to be a part of giving a portion both to seven and to eight, to be there to help to serve under the living Jesus Christ both during the millennium and during the last great day. And our attitude and responsibility is one of Again, following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ and having the mind and the heart and the attitude of God the Father in Jesus Christ. Isaiah chapter 54, and let's read here, giving us a good uh, capsule as such of the mind and heart and attitude of God the Father in Jesus Christ. Isaiah 54 and verse 7, For a small moment have I forsaken you, but with great mercies will I gather you. In a little wrath I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy upon you. And if we are to follow in the footsteps of the living Jesus Christ, we will be following with an attitude, with a desire to help and to be instruments of mercy and to have mercy on others. 
We are called, you see, brethren, to be instruments of mercy. Not instruments of destruction, but instruments of mercy in the kingdom and family of God. An unparalleled opportunity beyond compare, a priceless opportunity. And how blessed we are to have it. For a final scripture, turn to Romans as we consider our opportunity, our abundant opportunity and responsibility to be of service in the kingdom and family of God. We read in Romans 11, verse 26, And so all Israel shall be saved, pointing to a time when God's way would be available and understood all over the earth. But then in verse 30, it says, For as you, for you and me, for us, in times past we didn't believe God, yet now we have obtained mercy through their unbelief. Except one respect Simply because God isn't calling the world now, we have a wonderful, abundant opportunity, and God is giving us an opportunity now, and hopefully we will embrace it with our whole being. And we read then in verse 31, Even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy, through your mercy, or through the same type of mercy that you have been shown, that I have been shown, that we are being shown, that through this same type of mercy, that they may also obtain mercy. We are to be instruments of mercy under the living Jesus Christ. Verse 32, For God has concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon them all. That is the overview of the mind and heart of God the Father and Jesus Christ. And yes, these wonderful days, these days that we are keeping pictures an opportunity for us to truly be instruments of mercy both in the millennium and beyond yes these days picture an awesome future reality we are called to a wonderful opportunity and responsibility in the times of refreshing that are surely coming times of refreshing Times of refreshing for all mankind. Times of refreshing beyond compare. Times of refreshing that will never end.